How's everybody doing? I'm so excited to see so many people here. And I, I know that everybody, is, everybody beach comes, right? You'd be surprised when I asked that question. Who in here beach comes? There would be half the people wouldn't even raise their hand. It's like, now come on. How many people walk on the beach and look down? <laughs> yeah, okay. Everybody, everybody beach comes whether you realize it or not. Marie, we do have three seats right here. You know, last people in have to get to the front. <laughs> Come on in. We do have a few more seats. Got some extra chairs if anybody else comes in. But you've started the trend over here, so maybe you'll oh, find good. friends. <laughs> okay, good deal. Well, um, how many of you have found something on the beach that you really, you might have known what it was, but you didn't know a whole lot about it? Raise your hand. Okay, good. How many have found something on the beach that you absolutely had no idea what it was? Cool, even better. I love it. Well, maybe we'll solve some of these mysteries for you tonight. Of course, I know that means that you're going to have to remember everything that I tell you tonight. But just to let you know, I do have a list of references on this back table. And a lot of the references are up here. So after we're done, feel free to come up here and look, grab the paper, come up here, look, mark some. These are my favorites up here. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Terry Kirby Hathaway. I'm the Marine Education Specialist for North Carolina Sea Grant. My main job is doing um, ocean science training with teachers and informal educators around the state. So I teach teachers and people that work like at the aquarium or at a museum or a nature center how to incorporate the ocean into their classroom teaching. Especially, I work a lot with elementary teachers, getting them to use the ocean to teach all their subjects, because you can do that with the ocean. You can teach reading, writing, you can teach science, you can teach music, you can teach art, you can teach everything using the ocean. So that's what I do for a living. And beachcombing is what I do for fun. So I like to talk about this because ocean literacy is a, a new thing. You know, we've got so many standards in the classrooms these days. We've got National, the, the next generation science standards, we have common core standards, and we have the state standards. We also have ocean literacy standards. So one thing is we want to make sure that we have an ocean literate citizenry. And that means that everybody has an understanding of the ocean's influence on you and your influence on the ocean. People who live on the coast, that's pretty standard. Everybody realizes how much the ocean influences us, especially with weather, um, with our food, with our jobs and careers. And we all know that we have an influence on the ocean. And this is really important, though, for people even in Raleigh, Charlotte, Asheville, to understand that, that the ocean affects them and they affect the ocean. So that's why we do these kind of programs, is to work on ocean literacy for all. All right, whoops, I skipped one. How many different species can you see in this photo? I'll give you a few minutes. Different species, so I'm talking about different kinds of animals, or maybe plants, or evidence of another animal. There are a lot of different stories that can be told in here. Does anybody see more than five? Okay. Anybody see more than 10? All right. Anybody see more than 15? Oh, there's only 14. <laughs> okay. I know you're way at the back. It's hard to see. You might have counted something twice. But we're going to visit this slide again at the end, so we'll see how many things that you can figure out. And this is, I took this picture on the four-wheel drive beach north of Kerala. January 1st, 2011. I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> but I thought it was a, what, a neat, not, what a neat conglomeration of all these different animals. So we're going to learn a little science tonight. We're going to learn a little cultural history. We might even learn a little bit of Latin. I'm going to try to teach you a lot of things. And there will be a test. <laughs> 645. And I would like to ask everybody to hold your questions until the end because we're, we're uh, 
live streaming this on the web, plus it's being videotaped for, uh, so it'll be on their U YouTube channel. So we'll save the questions until the very end so that we can get through it. Okay, is everybody all right with that? Yeah. So make sure you have a pen and pencil in case you think of a question. You might want to write it down on your, on your paper so you can remember it. All right, we're going to first start with the phylum mollusca, taking you back to biology class in high school. Mollusks are soft-bodied animals with shells. And some of the ones that, you're, that you could find while beachcombing are gastropods. These are one-shelled animals like snails. So they carry their house on their back. Gastropod translates from the Latin into stomach foot. Gastro, stomach, pod is foot. All right, so you've already learned two Latin words. How about it? Then we have the class Pelecipoda, Pelecipoda, or bivalves. Bivalve translates into two shells, bi, two, valve, shell. And Pelecipod, hatchet foot. So if you think about a clam, these are two shelled animals like clams. Think about the clam, let's see if I can do this. The clam's foot right here looks kind of like a hatchet. And they use that to dig into the sand to bury themselves. So that's where Pelecipoda come, comes from, hatchet foot. All right, and then we have the class Cephalopoda or cephalopods. Anybody know what that translates to? Oh, don't look ahead. <laughs> head foot. Cephalo is head, pod is foot. So think about an octopus. There's a big head sitting on top of, a, of what used to be one foot that's now divided into eight arms. So that's what a cephalopod is like a squid, octopus. Little, either a reduced shell because the squid has an internal shell but an octopus has no shell, so they're a little more advanced on the evolutionary ladder. And then we have class polyplacophora. Poly means many, and placophora means plates. So you may find plates from a chitin. Chitin are, are the animals that belong in this class. They have eight, part, eight plates on their bodies, and I don't have any actual chitins out on the table, but I do have them hanging from my ears. I have a pair of earrings that's made four plates on each ear. So you can check out the, as I walk around, or you can come up and see it afterwards. But these are from a chitin. And chitons are, this, these are actually from Alaska. But we do have small chitons further south from here. I've never found one on Outer Banks beaches. But that's not to say that they're not here. All right. So everybody, mollusca. All right. So let's start looking at the mollusk that you might find here on the Outer Banks. The moon snail, or the, also called a shark eye. And if you, you look right there, you can see why it's called the eye. It looks kind of like an eye staring at you. Okay, this is not going to work. It's fading. My little green light fading out. Okay. But when you find the pretty moon snails, you know, they're, they're, they don't have barnacles on them. They're usually very shiny. The reason for that is this is their foot right here. Their foot comes out and covers their whole body. So it protects that shell from getting hit and broken by something or things can't grow on it because when the animal's out crawling around, it's covering that shell, most of it. So that's what it looks like. Has anybody ever seen one alive? They're really kind of interesting looking. That's a, a, one of its eye tentacles there. You may have found, this is what they look like when you find them. And anybody ever found one of these? What is that? Right. It's, an egg, it's called a sand collar or an egg collar. So this is how the moon snail lays its eggs. It takes the fertilized eggs and brings in sand, and it makes this kind of sticky stuff and puts the eggs and the sand together, and it secretes this egg collar. So, but if you've ever found one on the beach and picked it up, if it's dry, it'll fall right apart. And all you feel are the sand grains. But that's an egg collar. Anybody found one of these in the bottom left-hand corner? There's some of those on the, maybe in the, on the table, some of your tables. You may see one. That is the operculum. Another new word. The operculum, which is a trap door for this animal. So it's just like a snail. If you pick it up, it'll pull its body back into its shell 
and it closes itself off with this operculum. But the operculum from this animal is really pretty, uh, very shiny and amber colored. So if you look at the, this and looked at a, a moon snail, you'd see it fits right in there. It can really close itself off. Now, this is not a moon snail per se, but this is a moon snail murder. <laughs> the moon snail has drilled into these two shells. So if you ever find a shell, usually a two-shelled animal or another moon snail that has a perfectly round hole drilled in it, just like these do, that was done by a moon snail. Now, there are several other animals that drill like that, but the moon snail, if, you'll, if you can look very carefully, it's a countersunk hole in that the inside diameter of the hole is half the size of the outside diameter. That is typical of a moon snail. Moon snails uh, as a murderer. So, see this tiny picture up here, at the, right here? I'm not, I can't, let's see, there you go, green. That's called a radula. It's a scanning electron mic mic cross mic microscope image of a radula, which is like a tongue that's covered with teeth, and they use it like a drill bit. When they're hungry, they will crawl, find an animal like a clam or a, a crosshatch leucine. They will spit on it first because they have really good spit that starts dissolving the calcium carbonate. They spit and then they start drilling and then they'll spit some more and drill and spit and drill and spit and drill until they can get in and eat the animal that's inside. They're pretty efficient predators. So the next time you go walking on the beach and you find one of these holes, moon snail has been busy. <laughs> that's right. And they, they are, um, uh, they, eat, they eat other moon snails if they get hungry. It's not, there's no, nothing personal. <laughs> it's just what they do. All right, so let's move on to the white baby's ear. This is a real pretty one. And if you can see where it got its name because it's shaped just like a baby's ear on the inside. Outside looks like this. This is another one that when the animal is out crawling around, it covers the whole shell. There's the animal crawling right below the first top layer of the sand. So it's got a big white slimy body that covers the whole thing. So when you find these, you're going to see them real pretty like that, really and shiny and smooth. So that's the white baby's ear. Now, what story can you tell if you find one of these guys up on top of Jeanette's pier? Another murder, yeah. <laughs> Another murder. Probably a bird, though, this time. But birds pick them up take them onto the piers, eat them, and leave the shell behind. All right? Oh, here's some of my favorites. The whelks. Now, these are not conchs. We don't have true conchs in North Carolina. But conch is the Greek word for shell. Some would teach a little Greek, too. Not just Latin. But it's the Greek word for shell. And a lot of people have called these conchs their entire lives. People's lives, not the shell, the animal life. But these are actually whelks. There's a difference in conchs and whelks. There's a difference in the shape of the shell. A true, true conch will have a notch down here on the end. It's called a stromboid notch because they're in the family strombidae. Whelks don't have it. They have that narrow, narrow siphon holder there. There's also a, way, a difference in what the animal eats. These guys are carnivorous. They eat clams and other bivalves. And... Conchs are vegetarian, they're herbivores, so they eat algae. And there's also a way that animals usually move. These guys, when they crawl around, they crawl this, this way goes first. He's crawling towards the ocean that way. They crawl, that, they crawl like um, snails, but conchs don't do that. They have a thorny operculum. Remember, operculum is a trap door. They usually throw that out and drag themselves along. So there's a difference, several differences in, this, in the animal itself, how it moves, what it eats, and what the shell looks like. So what are these? Very good. Okay. You've passed your test for the first part of the program. So we have three different species in North Carolina, and we have these two are very similar. These two are very similar, but they're big differences. If you notice, this one 
opens on which side? The left. So it coils to the left and opens on the left-hand side. That is a lightning whelk. Easy to remember, the lightning whelk opens on the left. They both start with L. Okay? So if you had these two together, they look very similar with the knobs, but if you look at which side they open on. We've got the left for the lightning. Then we have two that open on the right-hand side. This is the knobbed whelk because it's got knobs on it. And this is the channeled whelk because if you look, it's got channels around the top. And if anybody's got one in front of them, you can look at it, okay? All right? The one, another neat thing about this animal, the channeled whelk, this is a live channeled whelk. Do you see how it's got a kind of a fuzzy brown covering on it? When the snail is alive, it has this covering. It's called a periostracum. And it is typical of a live channeled whelk. It has a covering on it. It's a living part of the shell called the periostracum. When you find shells like this, we find them with the snails not in them any longer, there's no periostracum because it dies when the animal dies. And sometimes you can find, has anybody ever seen one of these on the beach? You may have just walked right by it. That's the whelk's operculum. So that is the trap door of the whelk. So again, as with the moon snail, if you pick up the animal, it pulls itself back in and traps itself, protects itself with that trap door, with the operculum. So these are kind of neat to find. So be on the lookout for those because they're, they're pretty neat. And there's some laying around on the table. You may see them. All right, now another parts of the whelk that we may find while beach combing are the egg cases. Yeah, I've had people come up and say, what is like, is that like a spine from some large animal? Or is it a rattle from a really big rattlesnake? <laughs> Geez, I hope not. They're really neat. But if you look carefully, you can tell which species laid which egg case because they're definitely different. If you look at this one right here, you see there's no real edge. The two sides are together, so it's a sharp edge right there. I'll go over there and do, ooh, see, sharp edge. That's from the channeled whelk. This one is more like a coin. It's got a flat edge around it. That's from the knobbed whelk. And then this one has the flat, the, a flat edge, but it's got lots of little projections off of it. That's from the lightning whelk. So I'm gonna, here's another little quiz. There's lots of little babies right there. What species are these? Which one are these? Very good. Yeah, so these are little channeled whelks that they open on the right-hand side. And they look more like they've got a little channel, no knobs on top of them. But in each one of these capsules, and you see there's, there's anywhere from, you know, see how on one end there's, these don't have any eggs in them, any um, babies in them. But each one of those capsules has anywhere to 25 to 100, depending on the species, in each capsule. So that is one strategy of reproduction in the marine world is you have lots and lots of babies at one time hoping that one or two will make it to adulthood. As there's a hole that comes along in each one of these and the little babies, once they're hatched, once they're developed and have their shells on them, they crawl out of the hole. A lot of them are food for other animals, which that's okay. Not for those individuals, but it's okay for the species as a whole. And here's an example of a, a knobbed whelk laying its egg case, extruding that egg case. There's internal fertilization. And I can do a whole other hour on sex in the sea and tell you about how all these animals do it. <laughs> John, let's talk about that one, okay? But um, they have internal fertilization. The females have the fertilized eggs inside, and they have a capsule gland. These fertilized eggs pass through the capsule gland. This capsule is put around it and then put onto a string. And she extrudes these one at a time. So it may, it may take several hours to extrude one egg case. This is the end that usually comes out first. And that is pushed into the ground to act as an anchor. Because they don't want them to wash up on the beach for us to find. Although they're kind of cool to find. But... If they wash up on the beach and they dry out, then none of those animals will hatch. Okay, so that's the whelk. How about the slipper snail? Also called a boat snail. The reason it's called a boat snail, have you ever tried to float one? If you float them upside down, they float just like a boat. They're kind of neat. 
So you find these a lot up on the beach. A lot of times you'll find them attached to something else, like a horseshoe crab or a piling or a boat or a, an oyster reef. And they're, they're usually in a pile like this. This is down here. The large one on the bottom is the female. All the others are male. There's internal fertilization, so they have to be in close proximity to reach with their appendage to fertilize the eggs. If the large female dies, then the next one up, the male, will turn into a female. So they are sequential hermaphrodites. They change sex as they need to. Fascinating, isn't it? Pretty convenient, too. <laughs> now, because I told you that little story, you see their, their name is Crepidula fornicata. It's not for that reason. Get your minds out of the gutter. That fornicatus is Latin for arch. And that's how they, you see they've got the little arch, kind of arched shells. So see, it really has nothing to do with the pile of stuff going on. Okay, slipper snail. You found those, right? Everybody's seen those on the beach. They're really cool. I hear some other ones that you may have seen. Scotch bonnet, which is what's special about the Scotch bonnet? The state seashell of North Carolina. And do you know what? We, North Carolina, was the first state to designate a state seashell. 1965. They, our, our Congress, our legislature designated the Scotch bonnet, which, you know, it would be really cool if you could find the state seashell. <laughs> I mean, it should be the oyster or something. But they thought it would be the shape of it was like the tam shanter that because of our Scottish history. So, but if you're lucky, you can find Scotch bonnets. I, I've got several on the table out here. They're really cool. Now, you can also find lettered olives. These are all snails, remember, we're talking about. This is the state seashell for South Carolina. Uh, we have the three-line mud snail, which is a real tiny little, little snail. You can find it. It's got three little lines on it dark lines, eastern auger, and keyhole limpet. Those are also several that you can find, several of the gastropods or the one-shelled animals. Now let's go to the bivalves or the pelecipods, and we'll start with the oyster because it's one of my favorites to eat. Everybody eat oysters? You know what you're eating when you're eating oysters? Do you want to know? Guts and gonads. <laughs> Yum. But it's true. You're eating everything that animal's got in it. You always see the, um, they grow in clumps because they have to settle on something. So they might settle on a piling or a boat or a horseshoe crab or another oyster. So that's one reason why you'll see a lot of the um, restaurants will collect the oyster shells and give them to marine fisheries. The marine fisheries takes them out puts them in the sounds so that oysters, other oysters will come and settle on those oyster shells. So it's good to keep reusing them. Now, when you find an oyster, you'll see these big scars. Those are, are um, the, the um, muscles that hold the shells together. They just have one. So there's, it's a big one there. So those are the muscle scars. Um, and then you can see them in here. What do, you, do you notice in here? There's a lot of different colors. What's different about all, what's different with those colors? You might know? Well, the difference is where that, that has been buried, where it's been buried. Um, the sediment, the sediments, the minerals in the sediments take the place of the calcium carbonate and turn shells dark black. So if you find black oyster shells, they've been buried in the mud for a long time in an anoxic or a lack of oxygen in the in the soil, in the sediment. Another really interesting thing, most people just walk right by those old oyster shells when you're, when you're hunting, when you're beachcombing. But you know, these things are about anywhere from 10 to 15,000 years old. They're true fossils. And the reason is oysters do not naturally live in the ocean. They prefer a lower salinity water like in the marshes, in the salt marshes, in the sounds. So when we're finding Oyster shells on the front, either somebody's on the front side, on the beach side, either somebody's had a big party, left a bunch of oyster shells, or our islands are moving and uncovering what used to be a marsh 
So what's out front on the beachfront used to be the marsh on the backside when sea level was a lot lower than it is now and the barrier islands were farther out. So pay a little respect to those oysters when you're walking on the beach because they're old. They're older than we are. Oh, the base scallop, really pretty. All right, when you're eating a scallop, what are you eating? Muscle. Just that one little adductor muscle right there, the one muscle that holds the two shells together. Whew, much better, right? <laughs> yep. They're really pretty animals. They clap their shells to move. So they're kind of like jet propelled. And they have all these blue little eyes along the edges, but they can't really see images. They can tell light, dark, and shadows, but not images. Jingle shell. We sing that every Christmas, don't we? <laughs> Jingle shells are so pretty. They come in a lot of different colors. Just that's genetics. They come in all these different colors, the yellow, white, silver, gray, black, now, what we're finding when we find these on the beach, these are all the top shells of these jingles. Remember, they're two-shelled animals. The bottom shell looks like this with that hole right there, and that's usually attached to a rock or a, a, another animal, but that usually stays behind. The top shell peels off and washes up on the beach for us to find. And then we have the northern, how do you pronounce it? Quahog. Yeah, very good. It's not quahog. It's the northern quahog. Um, really pretty. How many of you have picked these up just because when you find the little pieces like this? I can't stop. I love the purple. Love the purple. Now, you know, these were used as wampum. Yep. Can't get much for them now, though. Don't try trading them for a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Won't work. But what's interesting is that the darker the purple the more valuable it was to the Native Americans. Here's one that has had the back part of its shell kind of sanded off, but look at that, the purple in there. It's just beautiful. <clears throat> now, one thing I didn't mention about with the whelks, and this happens with, this is with all the animals that we've been talking about. They start life right at the very tip top of the, the shell. Like, where's a whelk? Do we have a whelk up here? So they start out life right here, this tip top, the little thing that crawls out. They add on and make this shell. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. They add on and go this way. So they add on to the shell, and you can see lines of them laying down the calcium carbonate. You can see that with this, too. Look at all those lines. So they started out real teeny tiny at the very tip top here, the umbo. Umbo is the, the, that edge of the shell where the, the hinge is. So they started out and they've added on during each growing season. Now we don't know how long the growing season is. It might be one line every week in the summer, nothing during the winter when they're not feeding as much. But that's just how the shells grow. They make their own shells. They don't move around from shell to shell like hermit crabs. Neither do these. Other bivalves we might find, the jackknife clam, which looks like a popsicle, hollowed out popsicle stick. Uh, incongruous arc, there's several different, there's ponderous arcs, transverse arcs, different arc shells. The Atlantic surf clam, and uh, all of these are edible, by the way. They may not be delicious and really good. You won't probably find them in the restaurant, but they are, are edible. Some other ones that you'll see, the crosshatch lucine, these are some of my favorites to pick up. They're just so dainty, real tiny, about the size of a dime or a quarter. The giant cockle, which you can use to put your change in or your jewelry in. These, they're not always giant because they got to start out real little. We have the blue mussel, which are edible. And the stout tagulus, which is also called a razor clam. Those are edible also. And then the coquinas, they're so pretty. They're edible also, but I can tell you they're not good. <laughs> you can make a broth out of them. It takes a heck of a lot of them to make a meal, but you make a broth. Boil them up, use the broth in a soup. Okay, let's move away from the mollusk. We'll go to the arthropods, which is Latin for jointed foot or jointed leg. And some that you might find, these are jointed leg animals with an exoskeleton, so they've got a hard skeleton on the outside. We have the chalicerata, 
because that's such a fun word to say. And we're talking about horseshoe crabs. And then we have the crustaceans, which we're talking about crabs, lobsters, shrimp, crawdaddies. Not that we find those beach coming, but. So let's look at the horseshoe crab. Living fossil, been around for hundreds of millions of years. Hasn't really changed its body shape. Here's some live ones. It's got three parts. It's got a cephalothorax, and then it's got an abdomen, and then it's got a telson. This is, uh, this is what it looks like when they're reproducing around the chest, uh, up at the Delaware Bay. There's the big one in the front is a female. The male comes behind and holds on to her. She digs a nest, lays the eggs into the sand, moves off. The male's right behind her to fertilize the eggs in the ground. So there's nothing kinky going on. <laughs> these are the chalicera. Instead of mandibles, these guys have these little... Um, pinchers that move food into their mouth, and their mouth is right there in the middle of all the legs. So they push food into their mouth, and then they use their napho bases, or their knees, to crush their food, like soft-shell clams and worms. But a lot of times we'll find beachcombing are just the shells left behind after the animal has molted. Now, the way these guys molt is a split comes right along the front, and it crawls out and leaves everything behind. And everybody knows how blue crabs molt. They back out. Split comes along, around, along the back, and they back out and leave everything behind. So that's one difference. So the horseshoe crab is not a true crab. It's more related to spiders and scorpions than it is to crabs. But you can find blue crabs, of course. Lots of different crabs on the beach. We got the blue crab. Is this male or female? Nah, you don't have to flip it over. <laughs> the female has painted nails. So if you flip that over, you would see the Capitol building, right? Not the, not the uh, Empire State Building, or the Washington Monument, or the pyramids of Egypt. That's on the immature female. So we got blue crabs. We also have purse crabs that wash up. Um, sometimes I find them and they're still moving their legs, so I take them and pitch them back out and hope they make it. And then we have two different species of spider crabs. Some of these are considered decorator crabs. They pull things out and stick them on their back to camouflage themselves. Okay, here's another one of my favorite words. A canadomatus. That's how I learned to say it. Echinodermata. These are spiny-skinned animals with radial symmetry. And I'm talking it radiates from a central point. So think sea stars, urchins, sand dollars. There's a central point and everything radiates out from that. That's what radial symmetry is. And then we have the sea cucumbers that have the same symmetry. So some of these you can find. The beautiful margin sea star. Isn't that pretty? Very royal looking. We also have the line sea star, which is kind of dull, gray. But it's still very special. And then we have the common sea star, which is the one that has the bumpy skin that you see a lot. This, they all have a little, this little orange spot here, over there. It's the madreporite. It's how water gets into the body. It's like a sieve. Water goes into the body. And that's how they move. They have to have water inside their body to move their tube feet, water vascular system. So they have to have a madreporite. On this one, it's not as obvious because it's not bright orange, but so then they have a ring canal on the inside and the water goes down each arm. Echinoids, which are the sand dollars, keyhole urchins, and, and uh, purple sea urchins. We also have white sea urchins. Um, this is what a keyhole urchin or what people call a sand dollar looks like when it's alive. It's covered with brown spines. And then when it dies, all those spines fall off and that's what you find. Or if you find half of one, that's just a sand half dollar. <laughs> sand quarters are also out there. But the reason we call this a keyhole urchin is because it has those holes in it. You see, the they're called lunules. That helps the animal go down into the sand. Now, I've got a true sand dollar up here that has no holes in it at all. So this is a true sand dollar. So make sure you come up and check out all the stuff I have up here, too. These are my special things that I don't want to go away. I don't want any of them to go away, but these in particular. <laughs> All right, so, th so there's a sand dollar right there. 
All right, and you see how we're talking about radiating from a middle? Look at that. It there's the middle, and it radiates from the center. We also have these are called mud urchins or heart urchins. This was the beach in Southern Shores um, several winters ago. I think it was 2010. All of those, and you could just look down the beach. It looked like popcorn. And all of those were these little mud urchins. It was amazing. These are in a different group, but it's still echinoid, still uh, echinodermata. These are the, the sea cucumbers. They have longitudinal um, muscles, so if you pick one up, it pulls itself into this little tight wad. But if you mess with it enough, it'll, it'll eviscerate. And that means it throws its guts out of its mouth because it's disturbed. That's a defense mechanism. It's like fish comes at it and starts going after it, and it throws its guts out, and the fish goes, I don't think so. <laughs> Swims away, and then it'll grow new insides. So it just has to go a little while without eating. Me, I couldn't do that. But it's kind of a neat defensive mechanism. So now let's go to the cnidarians. These are the, the soft-bodied animals with stinging cells. And of course, we know these, right? The true jellies, there are, there are other kinds of things that look like jellies, but they're not true jellies. And then we've got the hard and the soft corals. So here are true jellies. We've got the sea nettles, we've got the moon jelly, and then the cabbage head or cannonball. Now, none of the, the, this one, you will feel the sting. Some people will feel it more than others because some people are more allergic to the toxin than others, like a bee sting. Some people are really allergic to bee stings. These guys still have tentacles, they still have tentacles and they have stinging cells, but they don't really hurt. Humans don't feel them, but their prey certainly feel them. Uh, the moon jelly, they have these horseshoe shaped. These are gonads. And if they're pink, it's a girl. If they're yellow, it's a boy. And then this one is also called, like I said, the cannonball. We used to, like, throw them at each other on the back, <laughs> back decks of the boat um, on one of my previous jobs in a previous life. <laughs> Hydrozoans, these are jellies, but they're colonial jellies. There's the Portuguese man of war, which we definitely know stings. But what's interesting, the float here is one animal. Each tentacle is one animal. So that's why I said it's a colonial animal. Each animal has its, there's four, three different kinds of tentacles. They're defensive tentacles, they're feeding tentacles, and they're reproductive tentacles. They have their own job to do. And then this is the float, the pneumatophore. So that's its job is to keep, that's on the surface of the water. These tentacles can be 10 feet long, you may, and they can break off. They still sting, even if they're broken off from the animal. So you may get stung by a, a jelly or a Portuguese man of war and never see the animal. These guys don't really have t uh, stingers that we can feel. Blue button, I'm sure you've seen those washed up on the beach. They're beautiful. They're just so pretty. And these are similar. These are called by-the-wind sailors. They have little sails on them. So they're at the mercy of the winds and the currents. And then we have these, and these are called mini rib jellies. If you look closely at them, you'll see all these little ribs. You usually see them washed up on the beach. You never see them with tentacles unless you see them in the water. They have really delicate tentacles. And you can reach out and touch the tentacle and it'll disintegrate. They're that delicate. But when they wash up, it's like they look like look, the bottoms of Coke bottles. Or some people call these breast implant jellies. <laughs> Because that's what they look like, too. <laughs> it's not a scientific scholar that calls them a breast implant jelly. All right, Caroline, you see it? She brought one of these in and says, I don't know what it is. And I said, I'm not going to tell you now, but I'll tell you during the program. Yeah, these are anthozoans. So these are hard and soft corals, colonial animals, too. This is called a sea pansy. Looks like a tongue. There's several, there may be some, there's some on the table somewhere, besides Caroline has one. But each little white thing that you see is one animal. And if you look on the back side of it, there, it has a little, little stem, it's called a peduncle. That's what anchors it into the sand. So it's like a soft coral. Remember, corals, all of these, each of these cups held one animal, so they're colonial animals. It takes lots of them to make a reef. So we don't, we don't have reefs here because the water's too cold part of the year. 
but we do have some little corals that grow. This is a star coral, it's a cup coral, and then this is called ivory bush coral, it's a branching coral. And then we have the sea whip, which you may find on the beach, which is a soft coral also. It's called sea whip because when it's anchored, it whips around in the currents. Okay, let's look at some vertebrates that you might find on the beach. Egg cases, right? Skate egg cases, mermaids' purses. This is the clear nose egg, egg case, clear nose skates egg case. And then this one's one has, you see it has longer tendrils. That is the little skate. So that's another species that we have here. This is how the animal, and there's one, unlike the, um, the whelks, which had lots and lots of babies in each capsule, there's one embryo inside each one of these cases. One embryo. There are holes in the ends of each of the tendrils. That's how water and oxygen gets into there to, so that the baby will survive. We also, there's bluefish jaw. See all those teeth? You see why it's called? They're called little choppers. Anybody ever been bitten by a bluefish? They're, they can be nasty depending on the size of them. Uh, sometimes you'll find burfish spines. This is the bottom of a burfish or a porcupine fish. And these are triangular, or triangular. So some of them fit those, the, these parts fit under the skin and there's a little thorn. So if you've ever looked closely at a burfish or a, a porcupine fish, you'll notice that they've got the real little thorns on them. But if you take that, pull that thing out, it's got anchors, like, like little anchors to hold it in. And then sometimes you can find otoliths which uh, an otolith, that's Latin for ear stone. These are in the heads of fishes. And in the wintertime, a lot of times you can find like fish skulls on the, on the beach. They just wash up. They've been, the heads have been cut off and they've just been processed out, out in the ocean, out at sea. And the neurocrania will wash in. And you pick them up and you rattle them. And what you're hearing rattling are the ear stones inside the skull. Of course, see, I do that stuff. I pick up stuff and rattle it. I smell things. Ken will tell you that. My husband's up here and he'll say, well, remember one of our first dates, we went out and there's dead fish on the beach and I was like, wow, cool. Let's go look at him. He's like, but he married me anyway. Wash your hands before dinner, he says. Here's some other things you might can find. Sea glass, everybody loves sea glass. Look at all those pretty colors. And if you ever get a chance to go to the Nellie Myrtle Bridge and Beachcomber Museum, she has the most incredible collection of sea glass in there. And we have Dorothy and Chazer at the back of the room. We're glad they're here. Yeah, they're awesome. It's an awesome place if you ever get a chance. If you see that it's open, go. But she's got all beautiful things there. But I just like that because that's fun. And I, I do know exactly how many pieces of sea glass are on the tables. <laughs> just to let you know. And you might see some plastic on this end of the tables. We got plastic, yellow plastic like this. See these? Look at those uh, diamond-shaped holes in it. Pass that down. If you guys on the end that have those, look at them and pass them down so everybody gets a chance to see them. Any ideas? Turtles, yes, sea turtles. Sea turtles, you know, don't have teeth. They've got that jaw, but it has a pointed beak, and they'll take a bite out of things just because turtles are not the smartest animals on the earth, okay? <laughs> They've been around for a long time, and they exist and survive for some reason. It's not because they're the brightest animals out there. So they'll take a bite just in case, but that's what's made these, these diamond-shaped holes in that plastic. And... Check these guys out. Fossilized ghost crabs. Now, I will be honest, I did not find those here on the Outer Banks. But I do have two up here on the table. That's why they're up here on the table. <laughs> I found those. There's a place in Florida, on the east coast of Florida, near Melbourne, that has a population of goose, ghost crabs that somehow got trapped a hundred to 200,000 years ago, got trapped in their, in their burrows and the sand cemented the pressure 
cemented this sand all around them. But it's just an interesting thing. And they only found them for the first time. I can't remember which hurricane it was that, like, I don't know, I can't remember. But it uncovered this whole thing. And people started doing the research and found out that these are like 100 to 250 million years old. It's crazy. Crazy. So anyway, all right. Now we're back just to show you. We've got everybody saw the blue crab, male or female? Okay, very good. Very good. Scallops, the, uh, oysters, got several oysters. Let's see, jingle, channeled whelk. I think that is a Venus clam, a crossbarred Venus. Moon, uh, baby's ear. There's a surf clam right here. The jackknife clam. There's some trash, so we have evidence of people. Um, there's some vegetation right there, so some from a marsh plant. There's some driftwood right there. Moon snail. And look. It was eaten by a moon snail. Murder. All right. So did y'all see all, y'all saw all those? Good job. Oh, and there's a slipper shell way down here. I missed that one, the slipper shell. Crepidula fornicata. Don't forget. Okay. Anybody have any questions that you're dying to ask? We, have, we do have um, Ryan is going to come up and give you a microphone. So please, even though you're loud, please ask a question in the microphone. This is for the people online and for, the, um, for the, the archived material. And there's somebody over here, too, when she's done, okay? Hi. Hi. I've, um, I've found nine whelks this winter. Very cool. And every single one of them are that blue color except for one. And what, I want to know where the blue color comes from. That dark, the dark black, dark blue? Well, it seems like most of the shells on the beach this winter have been that blue color. Mm -hmm. It's all because of where they've been buried all these years. Depends on, you know, where you found them. They probably have been uncovered as we've had storms, which, you know, turns up the beach, the front face of the beach. So wherever, how long it's been buried... Who knows? But that's why they change the colors because the minerals in the sediment take the place of the calcium carbonate. So it might be, I don't know what, I'd have to look it up to see if I could do some research on what mineral it is. But that's why they turn. That's why they change colors. Well, my father said it was titanium. Do you think that's right? That blue? I can't, hazard, I, I can't sure? even answer that because I don't know. Okay. All right. Does anybody you. know if there's titanium in our sediments? in our old marsh sediments. I got something like that. Oh, yeah? <laughs> so he, got a, he got a titanium hip? <laughs> That's funny. Over, over here, Ryan. Oh, oh, the color. So is that true for all shells? Like even the shells? The different yeah, the, all shells change colors. And you'll see some that have oxidized, which means they're in an... Um, let, they rust kind of. They got the brown color, so if, it depends on where they've been buried. So if they've been buried in certain sediments, they'll turn browns and oranges. But some have those colors anyway. Like some of the scallops have those colors anyway. The calico scallop. I didn't even mention the calico scallop. But some of them have those colors as part of their normal shell color. But a lot of them that are like totally dark. Like that jingle shell. Did you already put it up? No. The jingle shell right here. That one was probably not buried. That's probably just a dark jingle shell. But the scallop, the oysters, they've all been buried somewhere because that's not their normal color. Okay. I live in Southern Shores. I was happy to see the echinoidea shells that you, that you found. So I found those. Yeah. There were thousands and thousands of them, and I've never seen them since. I haven't seen them Why since. Do you remember what year that was? No, I it's don't. It's like 20, 2010 or something, I think. Why would that be? It depends on so much. There's so many variables because people ask, how come you walk out and you'll find a bunch of whelks in one place? And then you walk down the beach and there's nothing. Or there might be a bunch of keyhole urchins that come up. It all depends on the sediment offshore that they're living in. 
the currents, the waves, how, if the waves are strong enough to reach the bottom, to disturb where they're living and, and toss them up on the beach. If there's so many variables, there's no way to say definitively what causes them to wash up. But that, as far as you could see, I mean, went out there into that pit, as far as you could see, it was just like popcorn down the beach. It's crazy. Who knows? All right, another, oh, we got a question right here. Oh, surprise. <laughs> Um, I'm lucky that I live down on Hatteras Island at the point, oh, and there are times nice. that I find these little brown, they look like a button, and with, with they call them horse's eyes, the fishermen, and then horse's there are eyes. other ones that are shaped like a heart. I have two of them, and they're burgundy in color. I was told that they're seeds from the rainforest. Oh, I, di I missed a slide. For heaven's sakes, the sea why didn't somebody tell me? Is that it right, right there? Yes. I'm sorry, I missed it. No, I didn't show it. It skipped right by this stupid thing. It skipped right by there. That's why I didn't even show that because that's like my, I can do a whole hour on sea beans. Seeds from tropical plants that wash up, they use ocean currents for dispersal. And these have all these these ones that are here have all been found on the Outer Banks. Yes. Yeah, so we call them hamburger, but I've heard them called called horses eyes or sheep eyes. Um, but if you look, they look just like a hamburger. Yeah. So and this is called a sea heart, sea coconut, and then red mangroves from Florida. I found the, I found one of those at Frisco. Yes. So yeah, so yes, yeah, seeds from tropical plants. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I do have one more question. Okay. Um, you mentioned the Venus. Mm -hmm. Now, I have found one, and I think it's called an imperial Venus. Mm -hmm. I found more than one, but they're very unique, very deep grooves. Deep grooves on them, yeah. yes. They're more southern species. So, see, she's lucky. She's down south of Cape Hatteras. Yes. You're in a whole different province. So, this, we, in North Carolina, that's just my opinion, we are so lucky because Cape Hatteras is the dividing line between the northern species and the southern species. So we get both. And sometimes the southern species come up above Cape Hatteras and sometimes the northern species go below Cape Hatteras. So they're two different. It's the Carolinian province, which is where you are, and then the Virginian province is north of Cape Hatteras. So we're up here in the, in the Virginian province, but we're at the northern extent of the southern species range and the southern extent of the northern species range. So it's an awesome place to be, especially if you're beachcombing. Yes. But, you know, we have, we have the spiny lobsters in North Carolina, and we have the main lobsters in North Carolina. So we have both. Right, because that's right. We got those currents coming together, the Labrador and the Gulf Stream. It's an awesome place to be. Can I have one more? The, I'm sorry. <laughs> the angel wings. Yeah. Now, are they from the ocean or from the sound? They live in the sound. A lot of them bury into the peat or the organic material in the salt marshes, but yeah, but you'll find them, they may wash out the inlet, yeah, so you may find them, you know, on the beachfront, but it's because they've washed out of the inlet. All right, Ryan, Ryan's working the room here. Thank you all for being patient. You said you found the ghost crab fossils down south, never any here. Have you found other fossilized crabs here? There, somebody found one in uh, Kerala. Yeah, we have five or six that Do we found. Do you really? Yeah, and you can tell so whether jealous. they're male or female. And yeah. some, sometimes it's the, recognize the top part or right, the bottom. Right, or it's the bottom part, and we yeah. have one that has one of the, the claws left on it. Too. Oh, cool. But yeah, just up in the Kerala area. Well, I, I um, and that's where, that, that's where it came from. And also from. in, what, 20 some odd years of looking, one, one arrowhead, one point. Very cool. In the surf. Very cool, that's really neat. Oh, very nice. Good. Yeah, we took, we actually made a, um, a photocopy of one that the guy, because I used to work at the aquarium before I worked with Sea Grant. I worked at the North Carolina Aquarium. We'd have people bring all kinds of stuff in there. So we, some guy from Kerala brought this really neat fossilized crab. But it's not, it's not sandy like these are. These are, it's like stone. Yeah, they're stone crabs, yeah. <laughs> but not the, <laughs> not that kind. <laughs> Do we have enough? Got, yeah, yes. Hey, Terry. Hey, Adam. You said you uh, would find some crabs and throw them back in to hope they live. What about the whelk uh, strands? Can you throw if, those back in? If they're still wet, 
you know, and they feel real soggy. I, I try, mm -hmm. but they're never going to be anchored again. Right. So they may, and if it's really rough, you know, and I do the same thing with sea stars. If I see the little tube feet, you know, I'll pitch them back, you know, just, just in case they have a chance. But I do it with whelk egg cases too. Anything I see that's alive. Um, the little um, sea anemones are called sea onions. They look like an onion. They'll, they withdraw and look just like an onion. Man, I'll pitch those as far as I can. So maybe they have a chance to, to sink down and anchor. Okay, John, are there any questions? Oh, okay. He's going to see if there's any online too. But that's all right. Go ahead. I have noticed some brown, uh, I guess, shells. They look like wood, wood grain. Hmm. What would that be? I'm not sure. I wish you'd bring one to me. Because that's what my cards, by the way, my cards are back there too. And if you have anything, you can email me, send a picture. Because if you explain it to me, I'm not so good at it maybe, but I knew CB and I knew that one. But if you can email me a picture, if I can't, if I don't know what it is, I know a lot of people that can help, you know, figure it out. But that's, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Bye, Jeff. Bye. See you later. It looks like a ram's ear. I found it oh, on a yeah. bunch of seaweed that came. The, it was the Anglers Club were fishing, and I found a spot where all the whelks okay. were coming in. I picked one up under my <laughs> armpit, and a, and it was an octopus that got really mad because I took us home. Mm -hmm. But right next to it was this clump of seagrass, uh -huh. and on top was this beautiful white what look like a ram's it's called a, a ram's head or ram's horn and that is the internal shell from a squid yeah yeah you'll find them down in fact where we find sea beans and sargassum weed which is probably the brown seaweed that because all that stuff floats seaweeds are always and when when i go okay i'm going to admit something i yes i go to the sea bean symposium <laughs> there is one in florida every year my name is Terry, and I'm a sea bean aholic. <laughs> but down in, in, they have it in October every year, and it's because the winds start blowing, coming from the Gulf Stream, and bringing the sargassum, and so we just hope for rafts and rafts of sargassum, because there's ram's horns in there, there are sea beans, and there are all kinds of things that float. Rubber duckies. <laughs> that's another program, things that float. But anyway, that, that's neat, because but that is the internal, and I can't remember which kind of squid, but I think it might be in one of these books. But it's the internal shell from a squid. It helps with its buoyancy. Neat. Fulgurites. Yeah, fulgurites. Kerala is a great place to find fulgurites. Fulgurites are you know, where lightning hits the sand and fuses the sand grains. Now, there's a difference in dry sand fulgurites and wet sand fulgurites. Dry sand fulgurites they find around Jockey's Ridge. They're usually hollow tubes. They go, the lightning goes straight down. If it hits wet sand, if lightning hits wet sand, it kind of spreads out. And these are usually flatter pieces and big, heavy pieces. We've got one holding up the, the door, our bedroom doors, a fulgurite. So, but yeah, those are, those are really cool beach coming finds too. But I haven't found very many, so I don't put them in my program. But they're neat finds. And Nellie Myrtle Pridgen has, is it the, the world, ra the largest one? Or the, what is it that they, it's a, it's a big one. It, it's a really, it's a really, it's a really big one. And it's, the glass is like that thick in it. It's really amazing. John. Oh. John. Okay, Cindy. Oh, no, no, no. Do we have any questions? Uh, what? I know. I know. I'm, I'm oh, waiting. He's checking. He's checking. Go ahead, Cindy. No. How about ambergris? Ambergris. Yeah, there has been some ambergris. Anybody? Yeah, found here on the Outer Banks. A real small piece. Now, ambergris is whale vomit, basically. They, the sperm whales eat the large uh, squids, and their beaks are the last thing they don't digest but the heat inside the stomach of the, kind of melts them together and they compact and they, they, it, they regurgitate it because instead of passing it, so it's, and it floats. But to fi if you find real ambergris, you'll know it because it stinks. And it's real, if you hold it in your hand long enough, the heat from your hand will start to melt it. 
and it'll get sticky. But I've only heard of one. I've only seen, I've seen the piece that the guy from Southern Shores found. Yeah. You do? Will you share with me? Let me take a picture. Thank you. Cool. But ambergris is extremely valuable because they use it to f as a fixative in perfumes. And you, there been some, if, you, if you Google ambergris, you can see that some people that have found a big one like sold it for like several tens of thousands of dollars. It's crazy. So now everybody's going to be looking for ambergris. So, okay, it is. Oh, you have a question right there? Wait a minute, wait a minute, Richard. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I know. Thank you. I will get it. I will. I actually was just wondering if the sea beans are edible. Well, the, um, there is one that is a, an almond. It's a tropical almond. And when you find it, if you shake it, you can hear the nut inside. So, so I've never yeah, cracked it. Because they're seedy-like. So yeah. Yeah. Most of them, I don't have any pictures of the plants, but most of them are big vines from the tropics. <clears throat> They're usually in the Caribbean or in the, tri in the Amazon River Basin, the seeds are. And they come around and wind blows them into, around the Cape Canaveral area. But I've never heard of anybody eating them. So. But hey, who knows? Who knows? Oh, and, and one of my favorite reference books... Time for the commercial plug. It's North Carolina's Amazing Coast, which I'm one of the authors. <laughs> this is a, thank you very much. What, this is an A to Z book, and it looks at coastal flora and fauna and habitats. So it has some of these things, and the bookmarks that are back there are the illustrations from this book. So thank you, Richard. So I do, and I do happen to have a couple of copies. <laughs> but you can get it at uh, Downtown Books and... Uh, other places. You have a question online, Ryan? Yes, coming from online. Terry, I have a basket full of vul fulgurites collected in southern shores. Wow. You'll have to see them and confirm that's what they are. All Shelley. Right. Who is it from? Shelly. Shelly? Okay. Tell her to email me and invite me over. <laughs> I think you just did. <laughs> thank you, Shelly. Well, look, thank you guys very much for coming. This has been awesome.